Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Uh, sorry, I'm super close to the PCB there. I've had to do the start of the video at the end just because I lost a clip. But uh, yeah, as we left the last video, we dealt with uh, all the corrosion. I hadn't finished painting around there with the nail polish and cleaning up and stuff, so I can show you some more of that shortly. There are a number of things I need to do to this board. We had a RAM fault, that was how we left it, so we need to deal with the RAM next. There were a number of mods I wanted to do to this board. We needed to connect a keyboard up to test it fully and to help diagnose the RAM. But the next thing I want to do is have a look at the floppy drive, and then the floppy drive is coming from a full 2000, uh, which you'll see in the next video. Once I get that floppy drive working, actually, I ended up uh, moving on to the floppy drive you saw me fix, uh, the one from hell in the previous video, if that's not confusing enough. Uh, and in fact, I can show you here, it's this drive. This is the one I've used for most of this uh, repair, actually. It's been used an awful lot to test all of these things I've been working on, no issues at all. But we'll start by having a look at the uh, what I think is a dodgy power connection on the, the floppy drive from the uh, full Amiga 2000. So doing things out of order here, this is the floppy drive from the fully cased Amiga 2000 that you'll see in an upcoming video. So we're doing this in advance, uh, I'll mention it when I come to, into that video later, um, you know that we've done this before, I mean look at this, it's disgusting, it's uh, suffering from some read errors and obviously I need this drive to help me uh, test and diagnose some of my other Amigas at the moment here. Um, yeah, this is just unbelievable. I'm amazed this even works at all, but with some games, it's uh, it's just not loading and it's crashing and stuff. And yeah, I suspect this is why. It's all this blooming dust and dirt. So I'll collect all the dust and dirt up. Same thing you've seen me do a million times before. I'll perhaps put a link up there to some of the other videos, perhaps. Um, yeah, just collect all the dust, clean the heads, lubricate the rails and things, and we're done. Yeah, so I am getting lazy because, uh, like I say, the best way to do this is just to take the board off, but I figure that I can just reflow each of these like this from this side, and if that's all it is. Well that was worrying, I couldn't get it to read any discs whatsoever, I cleaned it three times, still wouldn't read discs, cleaned out that sensor, still wouldn't read discs, started panicking thinking, oh no, I've put too much pressure on the heads there, tried everything, and then I thought, oh I've got nothing to lose, I'll demagnetise it, demagnetised it. And it worked first time. I couldn't believe it. So yeah, that's the first time I've ever seen the demagnetizer bring something that's not even reading the boot sector back to suddenly working instantly, like night and day. It's like switching a switch on. So yeah, I'm very pleased with that because I thought that this drive had had it. So in order to diagnose this further, I need a keyboard. And uh, A2000 keyboards are ridiculous prices. The last one on eBay went for 200 pounds. £200 for a keyboard? You've got to be kidding me. So anyway, I'm going to make my own up actually. I've got uh, an A500 keyboard uh, coming. Um, it's, I think it's got some faults. So hopefully I can clean it up. It's, it seems like just some keys don't work. I don't know which, what, which revision it is, whether it's the Samsung or the Space Invader one or the Mitsu, one of the Mitsumi ones, I'm not sure. But if you look at the connections here, this is the A500 pinout. You've got clock, keyboard data, plus five, not used, ground, active low reset, Power LED, drive LED. So bear in mind, we're not going to have the power and the drive LED. You could adapt, you know, with another little uh, cable from the motherboard of the 2000 because there's a little a pinhead there for the LED connections, and feed that to the keyboard. But why would you want to do that? So you know, you don't need the LEDs there. I'm guessing any faults on the motherboard, the main power LED on the front of the 2000 will flash anyway, so yeah, you're not missing anything. And this is not for long term use, this is just for testing purposes I'm going to wire this up, because obviously I'm not going to have a shell to go around the keyboard, but just being able to connect a keyboard up so I can press keys is what I need here. And I can use that keyboard moving forward for other Amiga repairs and things. So I've got uh, an 8 pin header that's going to replicate the uh, Amiga side there and uh, the side that goes to the 2000 motherboard is a 5 pinned in as you can see so that's going to plug into the 2000 motherboard there's going to be a cable coming off like that uh, I've got, uh, this isn't really the right kind of cable, I need a, a shielded cable really, uh, but I've got six cores here, I'm only going to need four of them um, because on the, uh, five, the 2000 end here we've only got the clock, keyboard data, plus five and ground, these are the three connections aren't here. Now the interesting thing is that active low reset, that could mean that, the, well two, one of two things, I haven't looked at the schematics so I'm theorising here, that could mean that the keyboard doesn't get reset when the Amiga is reset, 
but if you saw a previous video the, there's a 555 timer on the uh, 500 keyboard so I think it has its own reset so I think this active low reset is perhaps when you do the uh, control Amiga and Amiga is it to reset the system maybe it pulls that line low to reset the Amiga could could be wrong there um, because I also read something else uh, somewhere uh, I can't remember what it was now saying that the uh, keyboard data or it might be the clock I don't think, I think it was the keyboard data the keyboard data pin was modulated or something something happened to it you know it was like a I don't know some sort of PWM signal sent across the keyboard data to do a reset I could be wrong I just vaguely remember something along those lines but in any case if we haven't got the reset I'm not fussed about that yeah I'll try and colour coordinate these to make them sort of logical that orange all does plus five so there we go, there's my dodgy cable, 5 pinned in to uh, pin header. So yeah, I'm not going to win any awards for soldering again here. I could use some heat shrink tubing on this. I might do this. After I've tested it, if it works, I'll pull these off, I'll heat shrink these individually. But then I'll find some way to encapsulate this whole thing here in heat shrink. I don't know. In theory, I could put it the wires side on. If I pull these wires down this way, you know, pull the cable so it's, it's coming down like this, then I could slide some heat shrink tubing over, shrink it, pierce some little holes, continue to shrink it, so the heat shrink's over the whole lot there, but these pins should be piercing through the heat shrink. Does that make sense? Um, it'll just make it a little bit more secure, a bit more robust, you know. But before I do that, I want to test it. This might not work. I'm just theorising here with this. I've seen articles on forums before. I saw a thread on, uh, I can't remember, Zami Bay or somewhere. It might be in the Amiga, English Amiga uh, board forum, I'm not sure. There was a thread I read uh, a few years back, I think. It was a 4,000 someone who converted the keyboard on a 500 to work with a 4,000. And I think the reason this works is because Commodore were intelligent and actually stuck with the same keyboard interface design. They didn't change very much at all. You know, the pin house you saw here, I think on the 1000, a few of these pins are flipped around. But again, it's the same signals. I don't, you've not got these, you know, the reset, the power and the LEDs and things here. But it's the same with the 4000 um, and I think the 3000 as well. You know, so the pin outs are different. Like on 4000, you've got the mini uh, DIN connector. It's a different type of connector. Um, and the CD32 as well, that's got a mini uh, DIN type connector. The difference with the CD32, you've also got serial ones. I think it's a six pin mini DIN. And on two of the pins, you've got the serial uh, comms on that as well. So you could get a splitter to give you the serial port and the keyboard all in one on the CD32. But nevertheless, like I say, you can do this for the different Amiga models uh, if you need to just get up and running like I do. Yeah, that diagram is incorrect um, on the A500 side because look at this, that's ground there. I remember that from a previous video. It's the third and the second pin. Actually, and there might be a pull down or something on there. Let me just check that. Yeah, the third pin is ground, and I'm guessing um, this pin over here, the fourth pin from the left, yeah, that's VCC. If I put that on a VCC point, yeah, that's 5 volts. So this changes everything, actually. Yeah, I don't know who did that original pin out there. That's incorrect. So I've put the correct things next to the pin numbers here. Just ignore the middle crossed out bit there. So the, the first pin was correct, clock. Second one's correct, data. But then you've got reset, not 5 volts. And then you've got plus 5 volts on the next pin down. Key, that means that's the keyed pin, i.e. you know, you don't have a connection going to that pin. Because if you look at the connector on some of the boards, they'll have three pins and four pins. Uh, sometimes there'll be a pin here, but on the actual uh, part that goes over there, there'll be a little uh, plug on that pin, on the key pin, to stop you getting it in the wrong way. But not all of them, so you can get the keyboard connector the wrong way. And I mentioned that in a previous video, if you go from the third pin from the right, as you're looking at the 500 motherboard, you know, um, straight on, um, the third pin is the ground. Um, and then you've got status and in use. Looking at the schematics, these look like the little LED drivers on the sides of those, which, so I suspect that's, those are the LEDs, which were, were correct, power LED, drive LED. They might be the wrong way around, but yeah, I think that's right, actually. So there were just a few things there. The plus five was wrong, and uh, the ground was wrong. So, keyboard adapter plugged in, keyboard working. So, testing the fast mem here. You can see we do indeed have a fault, so yeah, I was right with that. Uh, you can see bit 7. Uh, now the interesting thing here is it's showing up on the upper block, the upper uh, word there as well, you know. Whereas it's only 16-bit, the system, it's got 16-bit RAM, it's got 16-bit data bus, 
So uh, that's a bit odd actually. I'm not sure if it's frozen at that point actually. No memory found, press any key. Why is it only saying 16k? Let's just do... Yeah, the interesting thing there is it says fast 0k. What is going on here? Test detected fast map. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on there. Maybe that uh, one of the chips is causing it to have no fast map. But as it's going through there, you can see it's bit 7 anyway. Either on the upper word or the lower word. But the upper word's not relevant because we haven't got 32 bit system here. So, I might just target whichever chip is connected to, um, let me think, it's the upper byte, yeah it is, it's the upper byte bit 7. So like I think on the previous one of these where we did it on a 500, it was the upper bit on uh, the upper byte, it's the one lower than that, it's the bit before it. But anyway, I should be able to perhaps uh, measure around on connectivity, I think and trace it through. I mean, bear in mind the data bus is not directly connected to the CPU there, it's, it's buffered I think. Um, but anyway, I should be able to work it out. So to reiterate what I said before, we are testing off the floor here. Uh, it looks like this carpet, but there's a good inch uh, height. You can see I've removed a chip from here. This is the one that sits on D14 on what I believe is the fast. And the way I, I, I guessed, these chips here get warmer. And I think these are the, you know, the chip is in use more of the time because it's used all the time here for the main code and the diagnostics and the, the slow, you know, pseudo fast isn't. Um, so I removed that chip to test without that chip. As you can see, it is working. So that just shows that actually it is the, uh, the, the fast, not the chip. I'm just going to connect the keyboard up and we will go into memory tests. Uh, test detected chip mem. We'll just let that run through. Hopefully that will pass. Yeah, green lights there. If we had uh, that seventh, uh, not seventh, but seventh bit of the upper byte, you know, D14 missing there, that would fail. So at least I know I've targeted the right bank. That was a sort of lucky, <laughs> kind of a bit of guesswork based on temperature, really. Um, so I'll socket that up and we will try another chip there. So I've got the replacement chip on there, it's too early to celebrate until I've done the test, but can you see down here? 512 fast, it was not showing that before. So if I now go into number 2, number 3, yeah, detected 512k, let me zoom out a little bit, and it's going up in blocks. Hooray, it looks like we've fixed it, I think. Yeah, so sorry there's a massive light glare on the screen, but as you can see, it completed 512k. No, no issues at all. So I'm echoing things uh, I did in the 500, that 500 repair video where I repaired the RAM on that, that you saw here, that was, and I'll show you the schematics in a minute, just so you can work out, um, and just like I did in that previous video, how I worked out which chip it was, just from that diagnostic information there. But yeah, so uh, this diagram is a godsend for finding memory faults like this. But it could do with you know just a few little tweaks. I mean, one of the things I'm not sure about with this, it comes up saying it's detected as Zorro memory. Well, why is it detected as Zorro? If you the same RAM on a 500, it's not detected as Zorro. I guess the Buster chip is detected somehow, um, and it's making assumptions about that RAM. Then again, it might be addressed subtly differently on the 2000. Maybe this is a true fast RAM in a 2000, whereas on a 500, it's uh, pseudo fast, fast RAM. I don't know. I don't know, I could look at the schematics further to work that out, but I'm guessing the RAM here, this extra half a meg, is configured just the same way as it is on a 500. So I've not got the sound connected at the moment, but I'm just waiting for the uh, text to come up here to see if it's corrupted. It shouldn't be. Uh, that was one of the clues that it was a RAM issue, but it was doing really weird things, like lots of games were just rebooting halfway through loading. Oh, we've still got corruptions there. Do you see that? Mm, that is interesting, in the same places. That makes me wonder if we have solved this. So a very nice person helped me out with uh, Logica. You can buy this as part of the uh, Amiga Forever collection. Now the problem is, and I'm going to complain about this because I don't think, I don't agree with it. The distribution model, the way that this is released is in a .rom format and it's encrypted. Now it's only X, basic XOR encryption. If you take the license key from what I understand, 
and XOR it, you know, it's probably like a fixed length XOR key, uh, XOR it against the contents of the ROM, you can actually decrypt it. So the person who's given me this has done that himself. Um, I uh, will be purchasing a copy of Amiga Forever at some point. Uh, I just haven't got around to it. But I don't like the way that it's encrypted like that. Because the only way you can use it is with Win UAE. Well, who's going to want to run the diagnostics BIOS with Win UAE? That's just ridiculous. Why? What do you want to diagnose in Win UAE? You know, unless you're a developer of Win UAE, you know, the emulator there for uh, the Amiga, there's no reason to even use this with that. So I don't like the way that it's been locked down that way. I would prefer if they'd given this, you know, made made this available a license fee so that the original developer of this could get some money from it, you know, and we could just you know, buy the actual ROM and program it to a chip and actually use it. Even if it was 20 euros, I would have paid 20 euros just for this ROM. Yeah, but if you want to get hold of this ROM, get Mega Forever uh, and decrypt the ROM. Or just ask your friends, someone's bound to have a copy of it. But that really annoys me. But anyway, the reason I went looking for that, as you'll see, because Dag ROM was passing the RAM. You know, we, we found that first chip there, it was uh, bit six, well, it was the seventh bit along, you know, I have eight bits, it was the seventh bit along and I found it straight away, hit it first time. But then Diagram was passing the test, no problems at all. Now, I remembered uh, what I pointed out in a previous video when I looked at that 500 RAM fault we had, that uh, there's a deficiency in Diagram. It doesn't test uh, any, everything to do with memory. So it does no address testing whatsoever. So if you've got a problem with an address with addressing, you know, you've got a CAS fault or a RAS fault on one of these DRAM chips, uh, I picked the wrong chip there, it doesn't matter, it's the wrong system. It won't tell you. So we're going to test the Ranger configuration, right to configure, so let's do that. So we, we can go up and down here, see so the number of RAM chips, four, well there isn't, this is the one that's got 16. So 16 uh, chips, uh, and then the number of bits per chip, these DRAM chips here have one uh, data bit there. And we'll do, we'll just do fast, let's just try that. Uh, and then if we press left, in fact we need to do calc configuration, let's do that. Yeah, there we go. And if we go to exit, and you can press the left button to exit and test, or right exit only. So we'll do left to exit and test. And it should tell us exactly where the fault is, hopefully. There you go, we've got a fault already. A specific address, and you can see straight away here it's coming up and it's telling us it's uh, D13. So the one we've just done, the one I did with the help of Diagram, was working out as the one below it actually. So we swapped one chip already at D14, and so it's actually, uh, I think, in terms of di Diagram, yeah, it was the seventh bit, wasn't it? Instead of the eighth, you know, the eighth is D15, seventh is D14, so we now need to do the sixth one, which is D13. So, because I know this is in the same block, you know, we're in this test in the slow RAM here, this is in the same bank as the other chip, it's just going to be the chip next to it. I'll confirm that, I think, by looking at the schematics, and I'll show you a page of the schematics. But, so I'm just going to target the chip next to it, we'll remove that, swap that out, see if that fixes it. Sorry it's raining and I'm having to shout here. The chip we need to target next is this one. This is D13 of the fast RAM. So I've removed the solder there, just using the solder pump. Uh, I'm gonna pull the chip from this side, have the board on its side, and heat the underside, because I want to try and avoid damaging that socket. Heat the underside with hot air. I managed to not melt this socket at all, so that's a good sign. You can see it's just a bit dirty, so I'm just gonna clean up the contacts on some of those now, and we'll get a socket on. So just something else I want to show you here, and this is why in the first part I think I made the mistake of talking about fast memory and slow memory, you know, mixing everything up. Because can you see down here, this has got what they call 512k of Ranger RAM, but it's also a class as slow memory. And yet, can you see here, fast memory, 512k. And this is the thing, there's been a lot of uh, confusion within the uh, scene, if you like, when, this, when they introduce these different types of memory here. So, you know, it's classed as Ranger memory. If we click that and test it now with a replacement chip, you'll see it works fine. No errors at all. That's all fine. Uh, now, I'm going to put the original ROM back in. I'm just going to uh, boot uh, SysTest. And you'll see, uh, you know, SysTest is perhaps even more accurate because that does refer to it as a slow RAM, as you'll see. Yeah, so just booting SysTest. And incidentally, the floppy drive I'm using here 
is the one from hell that you'll have seen in a previous video. So if we go into memory now, um, you can see that it says chip 0.5 meg, fast 0.0 meg, slow 0.5 meg. So there you go, so this sys test is uh, the most accurate in terms of referring to it correctly as to what it actually is. You could class it as Ranger RAM, but then isn't Ranger RAM the fast RAM or is Ranger RAM the terminology for slow RAM? Um, fast RAM, you know, just to clarify, what is fast RAM? As I mentioned, and I got this correct in terms of the description, fast RAM is RAM that's connected straight to the address bus and the data bus of the CPU. There's nothing in between it. There's no buffering or isolation. So if the CPU addresses a specific address, you know, i.e. that fast RAM, it can address that fast RAM. And well, that's assuming it does it at the right time and there's not something else using the data bus and stuff. But So the idea being is that the CPU's got its own dedicated RAM that nothing else can interfere with. It doesn't need to wait um, it may well be that the, um, its data bus is isolated from the rest of the system there because Agnes is doing some DMA transfer or something to chip RAM. That doesn't matter, you know, your CPU in theory can still access your fast RAM. That's the benefits of having fast RAM. That's why when you've got a faster processor, adding fast RAM to a faster processor can speed things up significantly. Uh, one of the things you can do once you've got proper fast RAM is uh, sort of cache if you like the ROM kickstart in that fast RAM and then uh, you know with that, it's very clever the way it works but any calls to the ROM then are directed to that fast RAM so if you've got I don't know a 16 megahertz CPU or a 33 megahertz CPU instead of the stock 7 point whatever those that's going to be far 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 quicker than it would be addressing it from ROM and ROM is slow compared to RAM but also you've got that super fast clock speed as well. So that's where fast RAM is uh, super useful in these systems and it's preferential over slow RAM. Uh, and slow RAM is gonna be slower than fast, much slower than fast RAM and slower than chip RAM. Uh, pro probably the same sort of speed as chip RAM, I would think, because it's going the same way. It's via accessed via Agnes. So it's deceptive, we aren't on the floor here, there's a good uh, inch clearance from the floor. So the interesting thing is that first uh, chip there, we had uh, a data bit that was failing all the time, you know, that was like the bit 14, wasn't it, D14, and then D13, we only found that using the Logica Diag here. Again, there's a deficiency in Chucky's uh, Diag ROM. And I think it's because it's not doing an address test, that's the thing, it was at the point when this does an address test, that's when it, fault, uh, it found the fault where so uh, it's one of the address, but you know the address, internal addressing of that when you use the RAS and CAS to specify where something there, maybe the RAS has failed or the CAS has failed, something one half of that perhaps has failed or a bit on it has failed. That means it's pointing to you know one location instead of another location all the time. You know, so the only way you would determine that is with an address. You know, where you're testing, a, 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 I don't know, different bits at different addresses there. Maybe the walk test through the different address ranges for that bit. That's the only way you would spot that. So just to uh, kind of burn in this board and test the RAM there, I've had this going around for a few hours now just doing a test on that fast RAM actually and as you can see no errors reported at all so I think it's okay it was just those two chips. So the next thing I want to do to this now is put a CR2032 button cell holder here. Uh, it'll just make this area look a little bit better, it's covering up some of the damage and stuff there. I've looked at the schematics, in order to do it on this board it's as simple as removing this resistor here that feeds the battery and putting a diode in. Now I've gone for a low uh, voltage drop diode, like a Scotty, uh, I can't even say it, Shockty diode is it? I call them Scotty diodes. Um, yeah I think it's like 0.15 volts um, and it's switching uh, voltage there. So uh, you don't lose a lot of the, you know, the uh, voltage from your battery because you, what you're going to put on there three volt cell CR2032 three volts if you use a normal diode like a 1M4148 or something like that you're going to like lose 0.7 of a volt or something uh, roughly so 0.15 is ideal um, I just need to make sure it's the right way around the idea is that the diode stops the five volts that normally comes into I think this is the positive side the positive side here um, it'll stop that, that going into the battery if you see what I mean, because I think the way it works is the 5 volt comes through this resistor into the battery. So we need the diode with this anode on this positive side here and the cathode going to where this resistor would be fed from, if you see what I mean. So the, the diode will go here. Uh, I've just soldered uh, the points here in advance, added a bit of fresh solder. You can feel the resistor on the other side. 
Yeah, one side's going to be easier to do than the other. I think this side might be the easy one. Yeah, most of the soldiers come off there on the first path, pass. This side could be a problem because there's all this uh, copper here. Well, most of the soldiers come off there. Let's just give that side another go. Yeah, there we go. It seems counterintuitive, but sometimes adding more solder, even a crazy amount of solder and flux. Yeah, you can find it can uh, just help. Yeah, that's not too bad. I think I might just be able to pull it from the other side as it just lightly heats it. So all I need to do now is measure on, well, clean the pads up here because they look awful, those. Measure on continuity. This is the positive of the battery. One side is going to have a direct short, it's that side. So, what we want is, let me think about this, the anode on this side, actually. So the battery can only feed into the circuit. The circuit can't feed the battery, if that makes sense. Yeah, so the band's going to go down this way. This, I'm guessing this side goes to one of the pins on the chip here. Yeah, it goes to that corner point there. Yeah, that's right. So I just cleaned up the uh, pads there with the fiberglass pen, just cleaning off the gunk from underneath there, because obviously, you know, some dirt gets under these components and things. The corrosion kind of stopped just, just around this area as well, but anyway, that's that. So the next thing is the diode. I can't remember the part number of this at the top of my head. I'll stick it up there. Uh, so we'll just uh, carefully just uh, pull one of these out and as I say the uh, band is going to go at the bottom so yeah I just need to work out how much of a bend I need in these it's going to be something along the lines of that I think it will straighten itself out as I pull it into position yeah before I commit to soldering that I'm just going to just measure to here again just to make sure I've got that the right way so as you can see, you've got a lovely CR2032 in there. Let's go and test it. So I set the date and time on this well over a week ago now, and as you can see, it's held the diamond date. That's correct, it is Saturday 20th of July, and it is half past six, pretty much. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I'll show you what the commands are for that, uh, just so you're aware. I've covered it on another video as well, on one of the 500 boards, but nevertheless, it won't take a sec. So hopefully you can see that, I'm using the 500 keyboard here, if you type date, uh, sorry did I press the right key there, I think I might have pressed shift or something, sorry I can't type, I'm typing at a weird angle, there we go, date, it's got nothing to do with the fact I'm using the Mika 500 keyboard, it's just the angle I'm at, so yeah, it's echoed it back, but I can do 20 in July, this is how you do it, dash 19, so that's how you set the date, and I'll just echo that back, that's what you would do just to make sure it saved it. And then the time, strangely enough, use the time, the, the date command again. So uh, I'll just put the same time, 18, 31, uh, I don't know, 30. Did I press that? No, I didn't, hang on. Yeah, there we go. And if we echo that back, yeah, excellent. So at least you know how to do it. So the other commands you then need to do is set clock, opt, save, and as soon as you do that, it's committed to the real-time clock chip. So the other thing I'll cover, there's a number of jumpers on the board. There's one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. Uh, and I think one wired one here, J500. You can put an 8372A in here, you know, to give you one meg of chip. That is totally possible. I think it involves using J500, might be one of these, uh, two, I think three, three jumpers in total you have to change. One of them, you'll, obviously this one here, you'll have to cut on the board. You know, it's, it's a little bridge across the two, you'll have to cut that with a knife. But then it's just a case of changing two of the other jumpers. One of the jumpers shifts the memory start location for the second bank, I think. Um, but anyway, yeah, three jumpers and you can put an 8372A in here. So, uh, is that the right part number? 83728? Hey, yeah, it is. So I might get one of those at some point and upgrade this to a chip, uh, one mega chip. Uh, I'll cover that in another video if I do. But the one I was going to show you here is this little jumper. And at the moment, when I got this, it was across actually, and I just pulled it across um, so it was only on one pin. I'm going to put it back now. 
what that does, that enables DF1, you know, a second floppy drive. So what was happening with me when it was booting to the desktop, it was saying DF1, question mark, question mark, question mark, I think, because obviously it couldn't find the uh, second disk drive. But uh, I've been using uh, a drive that you may or may not have seen. It's one from hell in a previous uh, or an upcoming video. I'm not sure which. I'm going to connect this drive up. Um, so we'll have both uh, DF0 and DF1. So uh, we need to connect the uh, power for this one. You know, the cables could be a bit of a challenge here, just because of the way I've got the power supply. So get that the right way up. That's correct. Uh, we need to get this on here. Now the thing is there, see that jumper? That's when it's set to DF0, so I need to move it across one to make it, uh, if I can do that right, I'm not getting it in the right place there. So there we go, that's moved down one. That means it's in the DF, uh, I'm going to strangle this cable the right way around there. Just to go that way I think. Yeah, that means it's, is it that way or is it that way? Because that drives the opposite way around, I think it goes that way actually. You've got to be careful with these cables. problem with these ones, there's, a, there's no mark to say, we, well there is, there's a blue stripe there, but nevertheless these drives are the opposite way around. But if I boot up the workbench now, and then I'll point you with the screen, I'll put uh, workbench into uh, DF0, that's the bottom drive, the, uh, the drive from hell, and then I'll put the extras disc into this drive here. Yeah, and I heard it reading from the other drive there when it was booting, but you can see now we've got workbench in one drive and extras in the other. I forgot into extras. Yeah, that's the 2000 style drive. This is the one from a 1200. Sweet. But if, like me, you're going for a single drive setup, just remove that jumper and just stick it over just one pin, you know, so you don't lose the darn thing. There you go, that's not bridged. So when it boots up now, it won't even attempt to try and find DF1. Although I think DF1 will work from the external floppy drive port from the back. I'm guessing this has one just the same as a 500 does. But don't quote me, I'm just guessing. So I narrowly averted a disaster there. My disc got stuck in the, dro in the drive. And I don't know if you can see the label. Can you see just up here? The label is lifting up and that was stopping it from coming out. So I'm just going to get some of this double-sided tape on there. Make sure it's flat and then just press it down. Yeah, that should do the trick. At least my disc will live to see another day. So as well as doing the battery mod to this, there are a number of other modifications that I think I need to at least consider doing to this board. These Rev4 boards, there were lots of different mods that Commodore did and technicians and engineers out in the industry that worked out themselves perhaps. Uh, but I think ultimately most of them came from Commodore and there were perhaps changes and revisions that made their way into some of the later boards like the Rev6. Now I think my other board, the one in the cased Amiga 12, uh, 2000, is a Rev6 actually. So that'll be interesting to look at. It's got, got, only got four uh, RAM chips per 512k, you know, so there's 8 in total as opposed to the 32 RAM chips you've got on this one. But anyway, nevertheless, some of those mods, uh, let's see if I can find, there's a bit of paper somewhere I've just printed off. Yeah, here it is. This came from Ian Stedman. I'll post a link to his blog below. He's a really, really smart guy. He does a lot with Amigas. Uh, and I think the original article came from Eric Parsons, someone, I think he was based in the States. So you can see there's a list of modifications here. Same replace U602 and U605. 74LS245s with ALS245s. I've checked that. I think they're somewhere around this region here and I've got them already. So yeah, that must be a, a mod Commodore did. And then it's saying make sure that 74XX uh, 25s between Agnes and Ram are F types, they are, the ones down here are F series chips, so that's not a problem. Um, but then it says here, cut out C C910 and 911. I read an article about that, it's something to do with the keyboard, uh, well it is the keyboard, there's a couple of caps down here that go on the keyboard. I'm going to remove those in a minute, I'm, before I do that I'm going to show you what's happening. If I boot Lotus 3, um, you will see, when it comes up with the enter your, uh, I don't know, put your password in or whatever it is to play the game, it doesn't respond to the enter key, and you press the enter key a second time, and then it does, and that's the problem. On these early boards, it didn't respond, the board didn't respond to the first key press. It was always the second key press, then it would start to work. And that's why you had to remove those caps, so it'll be a good opportunity to show you before. We'll remove the caps and then test it, and see if, it's, if it works afterwards. Uh, there's a mod to do to the power supply here, so we'll come to that in a later video when we recap the power supply. And give that a bit of a service. But there's a number of other things, you know, check proper usage of ferrite beads at video connector, this one has them. Put th this one's interesting, put a 3, uh, 3K3 ohm resistor between t pin 20 and pin 11 of U605. I think that's something in the, uh, the related to the, um, 
slots down here, yeah it is, you know the uh, Zorro slots, I couldn't think of the word then. So yeah, I'll check if that has been done to this, if it hasn't I'll add that on there. And there's just a number of others here about you know removing, look at these caps here, remove a resistor, remove that cap. That's one of the keyboard ones I think, because that's the same, is it C10, C11? Uh, yeah, C10 and C11 are already there, but there's a couple of caps and a resistor to remove, and then more caps, C905, 908, 230, 240, a bunch of caps to remove there on these early revision boards. Uh, I'm a bit nervous about doing that because there's no explanation of why, but I do know that I trust uh, Ian and I trust the guy who wrote this blog, so if my, ca if my board's got these, I certainly will remove them. Uh, I'll perhaps put them in a bag just in case I need them uh, moving forward, but yeah, and there's a bunch of other things here. There's a bunch of others here, you know, it tells you on certain revisions of boards you might have resistor left of Q302 instead. Yeah, replace all Gary chips 5719 with MOS types. I've already done that on this one, you know, it does have, uh, it does have one of the original um, chips there. So I changed the Gary already. Uh, and then on the later boards, I think this is Rev6, this is there, Rev6 board. Mitsumi PST 518B, that's the reset uh, chip. Um, the reset on this, I did have a look at that earlier when I thought I had a reset problem and I couldn't for the life of me find where on earth that reset signal comes from. It looks like it comes from an op amp somewhere or something, so yeah anyway, I might revisit that at some point. Uh, luckily the resets are okay on here. Um, and it's just on about bad joystick things here, saying 74LS157, garbage from printer port, bad uh, CIA, so anyway, I'm going to remove those caps, let me just show you. So that's just been booting up while I've been waffling there, I'll press return. Nothing. Press return again. Nothing. Hang on. Return again. That return's not working at all now. So if I unplug the keyboard and plug the keyboard back in, yeah, it worked, but it worked on the second press. So yeah, ignore the fact that I had to connect and disconnect it. I think that's probably because I'm using a 500 keyboard when I shouldn't be doing it. But I nevertheless I did have to press return twice there, and that's been like this every single time with this game. Yeah, I tried to desolder them and ended up just cutting them off. And the article does say cut them off. I understand why. Because under here, the, the one side of them is all ground. And it's like the hole underneath the back end of the board. It's like you'd spend ages trying to desolder those with an incredible amount of heat. So yeah, just snipped off uh, C2, uh, C911 there and C910 from here. Um, so we'll give that a try. Right, so that screen's up. We'll press return. And it worked first time. So that has solved the problem. So I'm not going to do all the mods blindly on this, uh, they're just one or two select ones as I'm investigating these. So uh, yeah, I figure there's a resistor, it says add a 3k3 between pin 11 and pin 20 of U605, uh, which is this chip here, 74 uh, ALS245. Uh, uh, so it's a pull up I think, so if we measure here, can you see, there's 1k, you can just about see that on there, there's 1k already there. That'll do. So the first game I want to test here is June because this was not working, it was crashing here. It crashed at that point, after that message came up it would reset. And I think this is because this is the point where it uses that slow RAM, you know, the pseudo fast RAM. And I know that because if you try and boot this on 500, at this point here, just after that message and that cursor comes up, it comes up saying insufficient store or something like that I think. Insufficient free store I think it says. Uh, and that's because you just got a 500 with 512k chip RAM. If you add an extra 512k, you don't get the message. Uh, let's just turn the sound up. Yeah, we've got sound. It's starting to rain now here, but... Sweet! So, we'll do Monkey Island first, I think. Let's see if that one will work. I think it will. I've got no doubts this is going to be okay now. This is where having multiple floppy drives can be a blessing. Uh, I don't think you're aware, but the Amiga will support four floppy drives actually. So the 2000's got a connection on the back there. You could plug three, you know, the daisy chain together, three floppy drives there. Now we need disc 10. Uh, and if you had, uh, I don't know, this first number of discs in each of those drives there, your disc swapping is going to be m minimal. But obviously the best way of playing these games is with WHD load. One thing you could do is fit a terrible fire accelerator, and I think that's one thing I'm going to do. I'm just waiting for the 536, I think it is, 
to uh, you know get its final testing out of the way there there's a number of people who develop and manufacture and sell those you know uh, helping Stephen uh, Leary there working on that but once uh, yeah once that's uh, fit for sale kind of thing I'll be buying one of those and sticking one of those in here which would give me a 50 megahertz 68,000 uh, with 64 meg of RAM uh, which is good really and then I'll find some other use for some of the slots and things I've got some plans don't want to spoil it but yeah I've got some plans for the slots on this there's no music at this point is there let's just see if we can click past this it's not crashed trust me Again, we have complete success. Still loading. You always get that little pause there, as I mentioned in the previous video, I think. You can see the little Indiana Jones logo flicker, flicker, and there's a little pixel somewhere again. Yep, sweet. So I've tested a load off camera, but I'll just show you this one as well. This was one that was absolutely not working. It just reset before that even came up, actually. So yeah, that's working now as well. This is another world. Jamie Morgan played this game actually recently on his live stream. I might stick a link down below just in case you're interested. Um, yeah, he played it all the way through and uh, beat it. It's amazing actually. It was amazing to see him complete it. I don't know how on earth anybody worked out some of the puzzles within this game back in the day. Uh, or even these days. I look at it now and it's such a hard game. How do you skip this? Can you skip this? I don't know. I always thought you could skip this. Oh, I can't skip it. Anyway, you can see it is working. I think I've got the French version. Um, I mean, it, I think it was developed by French software house anyway, so it was Delphine, wasn't it? It might well be that they've all got French text on this part here when it comes up. I'm not sure. It's not really relevant. You can understand it because the words are very similar. I always thought this was technologically impressive at the time actually. You know, the way they use like a polygon rendering engine for everything within the game, all the animations and movements just look so amazing for the, you know what they were running on really. Bonsoir Professor. you come the Ferrari or something like that I think that says or I see you came in the Ferrari maybe it's interesting when you think back how long how old this game is and the, the theory there you know the idea of the scientists working on the particle collisions like that in an ex particle accelerator just goes to show you know that's not new tech is it really it's like we see what's going on in CERN and stuff these days and we think of it as being something in recent times but the, you know this was back in what 1990s well, just before that, it's amazing, really. And then I think, this is where I always get killed, these darn things. I think you can squish them, actually, can you? Yeah, you can squish. Yeah, that one nearly got me. And then I think... Uh, I'll go some more, look. No, that's got me. Anyway, you can see it works. Yeah, this 3K 3 ohm resistor here between pin 20 and pin 11 uh, of one of these ICs here is U605, isn't it? That one. Um, I'm going to hold off for that for now. It might give us some stability when we come to use the Zorro slots. I don't know. I'm just not going to do it until I need to do it, effectively. Because I know that that has got some relationship to the Zorro. 
And then in terms of this long list of components here, these ones with the crosses through, they're already removed. Commodore already removed them from this four point whatever revision it is. I'm guessing it must be a 4.2 or a 4.3 or something. So all those don't exist, they've been removed, they're not even fitted, you know, they were never fitted by Commodore. Um, those two were never fitted by Commodore. The two there are just duplicates of these two here, so I've cut those off to fix the keyboard issue. That leaves these two here, 905 and 908. And what I've been doing is investigating each one of these myself to understand what it is I'm doing. I wouldn't just blindly just follow this and remove them. Um, so 905, uh, let me see, yeah, 905 connects to the as the uh, latch pin, underscore, you know, latch, active low, from Gary. So, again, just for this moment, this point in time, I'm reluctant to remove it because I've got no issues, but it's filtering the latch connection there. So if I started having problems with um, Gary, you know, maybe some stability within the system or disk problems with, you know, reading disk drives or some sort of memory glitch or something when I come to add some cards, maybe I'd consider removing that cap. But all that's all it's doing, it's just acting as a, a filter there on that uh, signal. And it's the same thing with C908, that goes to the CCKQ pin, that's one of the clocks I think that comes out of Gary. Normally I think that goes to like the expansion, um, memory expansion interface, I think, I could be wrong. Um, because there's a what there is a clock goes there. I can't remember if it's that one or not. But nevertheless, that's doing the same thing. It's just a filter on that one signal. So just for the moment, I'm going to leave those two on there. Yeah, I've done the uh, one there. Add a point one microfarad hundred nanofarad on uh, cap under J three hundred, which is the jumper there. It's you can't quite see it. It's just between the middle pin and ground. Um, there's not one on it, so I figure no problems it's just adding some filter in there so i've added that on there not a problem um the one down here add 470 ohm resistor to d800 cathode to second pad from uh, left under cn605 it was a bit cryptic that it took me a while to work it out yeah so what it's talking about is the cathode of uh, d900 is it? Yeah, it's this one here, I think. So it's from the uh, you know the side there nearest the, the slot up to the second pad here. You can see there's four little pads underneath where it's a CN605. So again, I've worked out what that is. I followed on continuity. My instinct was that was going to be connected to the CPU. So I just probed on connectivity from there, dragged the meter down the side of the CPU, and we had a beep somewhere up here. I think it was like pin 20 something, 21 or something, and it's the VPA pin. So again, I'm not sure whether that needs to be done because it's, it already has a 4K7 pull-up on it. So by putting a 470 ohm resistor there, you're going to reduce that quite significantly. You know, it's going to be, I don't know, less than, around a K or something like that, or maybe a bit more, I don't know. It's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to reduce the resistance on that. So again, moving forward, if I have a problem with any um, Zorro cards that I fit into this, I would revisit and consider doing that mod just to see if that makes a difference, but I'm not in a rush to do it. And then the, the final one here is if R5179 is installed at a 470 ohm resistor between VCC and CPU side of one, R106, that confused me. I was thinking, R5719, is that a type of 5719? And it's not. There is actually a resistor on here, I'll show you. Uh, yeah, you can see there, R5719, so it isn't fitted, so I don't need to do that. And in case you're wondering where some of the missing caps are, We've got a couple of them here, three components here, resistor and a couple of caps, so yeah, Commodore never fitted them on this revision. And it's the same up here, you can see there's a cap position there missing, there's one here missing. So as a final look at the board, um, before we move on to other things, I think I'll probably move on to the 2000 in the next video. I haven't finished looking at the 500s yet, there'll be another one or two videos in that series. But this was just a, a distraction that, uh, well, it was a distraction. I couldn't wait, really. As soon as this arrived and the 2000 arrived, I've been keen to get on with these, especially uh, with me being on leave. So this area could be cleaner. Again, you know, it's a little bit bumpy and stuff here, but it looks okay. We've got the battery mod here, you know, the CR2032 with the diode. Um, cathode down to this side, you know, the band down to the bottom here on this Rev4 board here. I'm still not clued up as to whether this is a Rev4, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3 or whatever. There would have been a little sticker somewhere and it's obviously lost that over the years. I think I stuck that label on in part one but then obviously we discovered the RAM fault stuff but it's still applicable, you know, partially recapped with a red dot because I've only replaced six of the caps on here, we swapped out those two chips, uh, they're the same speed, that's important to know, I don't always talk about these things, there are lots of different equivalents, the ones I used here were I think were Fujitsu or something, or they've got an F, I forget what the F is now, um, 
yeah, MB something part number beginning with. Uh, and these are 81256 chips. But, you know, if you look at the ones that are on there, there's a Sanyo, I think they're 41256, but they've probably got a different part number. In fact, they do. Just looking at one here, it's a Sanyo LM33256-15. So this is the thing, you know, you can think, oh, I need a 41256, but actually, well, you can fit a 33. 256 you can fit an 81256 there's a whole list of these in fact that's useful i'll stick a link down below there's a list of about 15 or 20 different equivalents that will work in here the speed is the key you wouldn't want to go slower than dash 15 it might work with a dash 20 but i suspect not um, you tend to find on these you'll either have dash 12s dash 15s some might even have dash 10 i don't know whether they went as fast as that and it's, I think the 15 is 150 nanoseconds, that's what you're looking at. Uh, and dash 20 is obviously 200, dash 10 is uh, 100. Um, but yeah, you can mix if you go faster. So these are dash 15s, if I had some dash 12s, those would work okay in here. But if I put, as I say, I put some dash 20s in there, they probably wouldn't. The other point I would make in terms of future reliability, you could argue that, yeah, two of these has failed, maybe one or two more will start to fail with extended use. Now, I have been using this on test since I did the RAM repair there for a week or so, uh, and I've used it a fair bit, no issues at all, no glitches, no crashes, no nothing. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, but you, again, like I say, if I use this continuously for a year, maybe another one will fail. And then I could fix that, and then maybe in the three months something else would fail, maybe one or two others. So you might want to consider swapping all of the RAM here, but that's just painful. You can get a little PCB, certainly for the one that uses four chips, to replace its little SRAM. Uh, in fact, it doesn't use SRAM, it uses EDO, uh, DRAM. Um, so you can get things like that to replace. You know, so you, What you would do is remove all the chips, plug in so that each of the data bits is connected to the little PCB there. You could even make something yourself to do that. I might have a go at that at some point. Another thing to point out while we're here, I've been testing the two Sanyo chips, you know, just to, re you know, just to check things, you know, putting them back in, testing, yeah, the fault's definitely there, take it out, put this one in, it's gone. But what, one thing I did know is that what, this one here that has got a, 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 a data bit that was a fault on it, didn't it? So, the, the, you know, that it was always outputting a high or always outputting a low regardless. That gives a yellow screen currently. You know, if you put this back in into that position there, it gives a yellow screen. So that's useful to know. If you get a yellow screen on one of these, yellow screen uh, from the BIOS, you know, from Kickstart, indicates you've got a hardware fault. But it could just be something as simple as uh, bad RAM bad RAM on there so because that's the first time I've seen a yellow screen that way I think I've seen a yellow screen before with either a faulty Denise or a faulty Agnes but it's super 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 rare to get that kind of behavior but so I just thought it was interesting to point out that DRAM can give you a yellow screen but more often than not as we saw with the, the chip that was in this position originally um, you know you get failures at certain addresses and things and it can be glitchy and intermittent so, you know so the system was doing its normal you know the kickstart like it was dark grey light grey white and it was booting um, you, uh, diagram here when we had diagram in here it was happy as anything no problems at all it was only logica that helped me find that and sys also is just as capable at finding that type of addressing fault where you know, and I'm assuming that the, not this chip, because this is the one that's got a faulty um, data bit on it, you know, the actual input-output pin is constantly high. The one that was originally um, in uh, this position here, it had a failed address, you know, somewhere. You know, it was like a, the, something wrong with RAS or CAS, one of the address bits. So I guess the other thing that's been useful in this video is to show you, you can use a 500 keyboard on this. Um, now there are some, um, what they call checkmate cases, aren't they, being built, and new keyboard enclosures which will accommodate a 500 or 500 plus keyboard like this. This isn't the keyboard I started off on this video with. Uh, I fixed that in a previous video, you'll see. This is a video from 500 plus, which again, I have fixed as well, which uh, will be a part of one of the Amiga 500 series repairs there that will be coming up soon. But hopefully, uh, the guy who's, uh, I think it's Stephen, isn't he, is he called? The guy who's doing the checkmate cases, uh, hopefully he'll offer those out to, to, you know, to buy, not just from the Kickstarter campaign, because currently that's the only way you can get one of the new cases for one of these boards, uh, or a case for a keyboard like this. But if, if I can buy one of those off him, that would be super brilliant as well. And in fact, I've kind of got in my mind, I'd like to buy two checkmate cases, and probably two checkmate uh, keyboard enclosures. Um, because I can house this in a checkmate case. Another point I would make here is you could get yourself a decent full tower PC case and you could customize it 
to fit this you know something like this you might have to do a bit of cutting and a bit of welding or something on there but you could fit one of these 2000 boards in a, a standard PC case and with a bit of wiring or a, and a you know a plug like that you can connect up an ATX power supply without issue so then all you need is a keyboard well we've proven you can do a keyboard super easy and there's a few different solutions one which we'll look at in a future video that allows me to use a PC keyboard actually now Amiga floppy drives like this one, this is again one I fixed in a previous video, the buttons just fell off, I need to connect that back up. Um, you can replace with uh, a certain PC high density floppy drives. All you do is you, well not all drive models are compatible but some of them are. Um, and you swap over I think the uh, drive select pin and then you uh, reroute the ready signal to the HD switch, you know, the high density switch. Because PC drives don't have a, de a disk detection switch, if that makes sense. You know, these Amiga ones, that's one thing that's bespoke about them. They have the, the uh, write protect switch there, but they also have another switch that when you put the disk in, it detects that there's a disk in, so then it starts to boot or read from it, etc. PC floppy drives typically don't have that, but they will have over here a high, high density switch to determine whether it's a HD disk or a, you know, a standard definition disk, double density disk, 720K or 1.44. So if you use that switch in place of the uh, disk detect switch, you know, it goes to the ready pin, you can use a standard PC floppy drive. So anyway, all that waffle aside, the point I'm trying to make is you could if you bought a board like this, and there are some of these available on eBay, um, there's one unpopulated up, up now in the US, I think it's about 30 quid or something with about 20 pounds shipping. There's no chips on there, so you could populate the chips, you need to find a buster. Uh, you could build yourself a 2000 without too much effort. And if uh, those cases come uh, available from Stephen, you know, the Chatmate ones, again, you could have a really sweet uh, big box Amiga system just by purchasing one of these boards like this and fixing it. So I do hope you found the video interesting, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.